It might have surprised a lot of people that Doc Rivers was fired yesterday. But if you listen closely enough to some sound bites, there were subtle hints being dropped. You said the ball didn't get to you. Does the coach call plays to try to get the ball to you? Nice question. How has your relationship been with Doc, and would you like to see him back? Uh, yeah, okay. our relationship is okay. It's, it's not what I want to say, but yeah, just it's frustrating. James Harden was not all that supportive of Doc Rivers in his press conference yesterday. One person said to me, it'd be hard for me to see James wanting to come back and play for Doc again. This has been a subject I've wanted to explore for some time. How good a coach is Doc Rivers? He won Coach of the Year award in his very first year with the Magic, leading a malformed roster of misfits to a 500 record with a win improvement of eight games, beating out two other coaches who appeared to squeeze a lot more out of their teams. My Orlando team is the HC. No one gives me credit for getting up against the Pistons who won the title. That was an HC. Go look at that. I want you to go back and look at that roster. Yikes. I, I dare you to go back and look at that roster, and you would say, what a hell of a coaching job. Really? Really. This is borderline disingenuous, since his team did have prime Tracy McGrady, and that Pistons team did not win the title that year. In fact, they didn't have Rasheed Wallace yet and had to change coaches to beat the Lakers in 2004. Doc Rivers has always been what we used to call a player's coach, a former player who could connect with the roster on a personal level and know how to motivate them since he was one of them. Doc, you think Ben Simmons can, can still be a point guard for, for a championship team like the one you guys want to become? Yeah, David, I don't know that question or the answer to that right now. Um, Oof. You know, so I don't know the answer to that. But if he was willing to be this unsupportive of his starting guard in public, you have to wonder what he said to the team in private. Part of being this kind of player coach is to leave it to his players to quote unquote make the plays. And Rasheed Wallace gave us some insight having played for Doc in Boston. Get Glenn out of there. You gotta get somebody in there that the players respect. He doesn't make adjustments. That's just from being in the locker room with him for that one season. That seems to always be his biggest knock. If his team is up, you don't really have to coach shit then. When you in the trenches and you going against another team and another good coach, you gotta be more than a locker room manager. He depends more on the players to make those adjustments. But that coach also, you have to come in there and make adjustments as well, especially if what you're trying hasn't worked. And when we were in Boston, as far as the players out there on the floor, we were the one that made the adjustment. All right, come out the huddle. Right before we get on the floor, we huddle up like, all right, look, yo. Nope. Hey, f that. We're going to do this. Boom, 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 boom. For the way that Glenn is, he's not that hard-nosed coach that we need. Nobody wanted to believe me. Now look. So if a guy who played for him is saying this, then perhaps Doc is tired and out of energy. And I don't blame him, considering he's continuously coached for 24 straight seasons, which is why he should be drinking Athletic Greens, a nutritional drink that boosts energy and mental clarity. It's incredibly simple to make one scoop in about 10 ounces of water, shake, and drink. For me, the energy boost is almost immediate and lasts for much of the day. Believe me, it tastes good, and I'm very picky about that kind of thing. My digestion feels a lot better with AG1, and at my age, that's huge because it's gluten-free, dairy-free, no sugar added, and it can replace your multivitamin, probiotics, and immunity support with just one scoop daily. Click my link below to get a one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D3K2 and five travel packs free with your first purchase. Take a lesson from the scoop shop by Jokic and try one scoop a day from AG1. A big issue with him was how he carried himself on the sidelines, especially during his time in Los Angeles. It seemed almost every referee's call against his team was an affront to humanity, worthy of a big show of negative emotion that the players would feed off of and it would completely affect their play. The true test of the coach's value is how his teams fare in the playoffs. And while his regular season winning record ranks 32nd in percentage, his playoff record is a bit closer to average. Of course, injuries have played a major role in some of his playoff runs, but that happens to every coach. Doc has coached in a league leading 16 Game 7s throughout his career, and his record does not compare favorably to many of the great coaches. Even at home, he barely broke 500, despite the home team winning over 75% of the time overall. Even worse, 10 of his 11 losses in Game 7s were blowouts. So I decided to examine the moment each of these games fell apart to see if there was a theme. 
it quickly became apparent that his teams consistently melted down amidst a flurry of turnovers, bad shots, and confounding defense. When the other team started to get going, they fell apart. For a coach who puts the fate of his team in the players' hands as much as Doc does, it's hard to ignore the through line of mental collapses that continually plagued his teams. And at some point, you've got to stop blaming the players and look to the sideline leader. Let's look at a bunch of his Game 7 losses because the evidence begins to mount. We need look no further than three days ago when they lost in grand fashion to the Celtics on the road, going small against the two bigs of the Celtics and exploiting the mismatch from behind the arc. But what we saw starting in the second quarter was a team that completely fell apart on both ends of the floor. Despite Harden spinning Brown all the way around in transition, he not only just drops the ball out of bounds, but flails into Brown's face, earning him a deserved flagrant foul, turning a potentially solid 9-point lead into a measly 4-point dogfight as Niang doesn't bump down in the roll man and Tatum lobs for the easy dunk. But the unraveling continued in spectacular fashion, as Maxi tries to throw a simple high post entry pass, but look where he bounces it, not even midway between him and Harden, and it was never open anyway as Brown pounces on it and gets all the way to the hoop for a layup. The bottom began to fall out as Harden just dribbles it to Robert Williams, and on the other end, they were able to get back into defensive position okay, but at this point, Tatum already has 14 points and wants to get cooking. Why isn't PJ Tucker parking himself on that left block, with Embiid zoning up the backside with Williams in the dunker spot? As a result, he's not there when Tatum spins and there's no help to stop the layup from going in. I have no problem with going down low to Embiid, although for the series, Horford had pretty much manhandled him one-on-one, -on -one, and he promptly blows the little bunny hook. Before we continue documenting this meltdown, I want to take a trip back in time to a few other Game 7s that Doc has coached in, since there are a number that had similar results, and it feels like there's a theme here. In 2003, while coaching the Magic, they were hanging tough until the second quarter when they get into full scramble mode because they kind of double, but really, DeClerc is just standing there, giving Tayshaun Prince a decent look. Tracy McGrady comes right back down and then blows this lob without any defensive pressure on him. Then, they help foolishly from one pass away off the corner to the guy who had just catapulted one three-pointer in already, and he increases the lead to seven. And then a little bit later, they allow middle penetration way too easily, and it opens up a wide-open shot for Prince that just about ended the game here. These Game 7s are riddled with mistakes made from the pressure of the moment more so than what Doc's opponents were doing. Let's cut to 2005 against the Pacers, where just like in 03, this downward spiral starts by giving up a wide open three-pointer as Paul Pierce falls asleep and lets Steven Jackson swish one to increase the lead. Next, Pierce comes off that pin down on the left side and Jackson just pokes it away, which forced him to foul in transition where the Pacers got two more points from the foul line. It was Ricky Davis' turn to try a foolish wraparound pass with no space inside as the Celtics are unraveling before our eyes. A little later, when you need the defense to be on point, Delonte West decides to neither double nor guard his man, hovering in no man's land as they give up an easy layup, and this was before Tom Thibodeau got there to take over this side of the floor. They try to do it again with an almost equally ineffective double of the post. No one can get close to the shooter, and an 11-point lead in this game is practically a blowout. But it kept getting worse. There isn't anyone guarding Davis on the perimeter, yet he just forces this pass into the post on a terrible angle. And to end the game early in the fourth, they offer help on the ISO from the one guy you can't help off of. The pass is too easy, the shot too open, and it's another Game 7 blowout for a Doc coach team. We finally get to some HD footage by 2009 when Orlando ends the defending champ season in the second round. As a coach, I can't argue with the quality of shot they get, but this is Kendrick Perkins, who never met a blown layup he didn't like. It was interesting how three-point shots tended to start the meltdowns for Doc's teams in Game 7s, and this isn't terrible defense by Ray Allen, but Mikhail Petris came to play. The Magic were one of the early modern offenses with plenty of shooters and lots of attacking closeouts. So credit to the Celtics defense for good rotations all around until Allen just fouls Courtney Lee as he's getting blown by for the and one. The game is getting out of hand and you're at home, so a timeout was probably warranted, but at least during the free throw, make sure Paul Pierce is going to get his hands on the ball. Instead, it's a ridiculous Ricky Davis, Kendrick Perkins pick and roll, and I'm just embarrassed that Perk even tried this on Dwight frickin' Howard. This might look familiar as the Magic hurried down court, forcing Perkins into a mismatch, and despite Lee doing a curly kneel impression from the Globetrotters, they catch two defenders rotating to the ball and another drive to pull up and the Celtics have cracked. They end it completely off this skip pass when all Big Baby has to do is catch the ball that's basically thrown right at him. 
Instead, Dwight makes it two free throws and the route is on. Over and over again, these are examples of what a team looks like when it's not very well coached. You may remember this slugfest in the 2010 finals, and while it wasn't a blowout, it had all the hallmark mistakes of a doc coach team in a game seven. Rondo helps one pass away off of Derek Fisher of all people, and a three is like six points in a low scoring game like this one. But mental mistakes still happened. What in the world did Pierce think was going to happen with this fake attempt at taking a charge? But after that, how in the world can the Celtics screw up who they were guarding? Sheed wants to guard Powell, but that leaves Rondo on the 6'11 Lamar Odom, and KG has no idea where he's going, wandering around for several seconds and then not switching with Rondo. Now he's stuck dealing with Gasol on the roll, and there's no way Rondo is keeping him off the boards here after the Kobe miss. And this led to the free throws that ended the game. Wow. In the last game he coached for the Celtics, I can acknowledge they were outgunned versus the Heatles in 2012, but here we were anyway, in a game seven where anything could happen, and Paul Pierce lets Dwayne Wade just take his cookies from him. In a crucial moment when you know that LeBron was A, going to ISO, and B, make the open pass, KG shouldn't be helping one pass away off the corner here. It's Pierce's help, so James makes the easy pass and Bosch takes the easy shot to start the blowout. The Celtics got a lot of mileage out of the Ray Allen ball screen for Pierce and the flare screen, but what is the spacing on the other side? Bass and Rondo bring their men right to the hoop to not only block the shot, but it goes out of bounds off of Pierce. They never really figured out how to get KG in proper help positions. He should have switched with Pierce here so he could be in the lane to try and stop LeBron. Instead, he shoots this one on the way down over the ineffective contest from Pierce. In the last ditch effort to post up KG with LeBron guarding him, Pierce is smart not to try a lob. Why aren't they flashing the high post to get a quick high-low pass to him? Instead, Rondo basically ends the game with this silly lob attempt that Bosch was all over the second he released it. And out of the timeout, Rondo doesn't run the play that was called, which was to get it to Pierce coming off this flare screen. He simply wasn't the guy you wanted creating in this situation, and Bosch shows us why. It's the 2015 Clippers Rocket series, and if we're talking meltdowns, this one was Doc's worst. We have to mention game six because the Clippers got outscored 51 to 20 over the final 15 minutes of the game after having a big lead, and that was without James Harden on the floor for a second of the fourth quarter. You could just see how the team was shell-shocked and broken amidst a cascade of mental mistakes that fed from one to the next. And while they hung tough till the third quarter of Game 7, the residual effects were about to end their season. As the Rockets bring DeAndre Jordan up in the pick and roll, Redick allows Harden to reject the screen, which means Jordan is out of position to protect the rim, and here we go again. Blake gets into the lane very deliberately, but tries a contested lefty jump hook, which misses wildly. I'm sure he was still thinking about it on the way back down instead of picking up the guy who had cut their hearts out in Game 6, leading to the wide-open triple. Going through these games, you can just tell when it's happening, as Chris Paul throws this ridiculous pass out of bounds. It's hard to see the beginning of the play, but it takes way too long for the remaining three Clippers to hustle back down the court, and as a result, Jordan has left the guard Prigioni and Redick on Dwight. DJ doesn't even really help here, just puts himself in a terrible position for the easy pass out and wide open three. You will often hear Doc say his teams didn't trust each other enough. Well, that's the coach's responsibility, as Blake's teammates leave him with no rotational support and Smith scores again. This was their last chance to do something with a call play from the sideline. If you don't think this was a team in panic mode based on this play, well, I don't really know what to tell you. And this is why we have coaches, to help their teams avoid these situations. And yet this Clippers team would allow each mistake to build to the next until the game was over early. Let me take you to the bubble, where another three-pointer sparks the run that turned a Doc Rivers coach game seven into a blowout loss. Immediately after, Paul George gets all the way to the rim but throws a two-foot bounce pass while in the air and Jokic easily steals it. On the way back down, everything seems okay as the defense sets up in good position, but Paul George and Pat Beverly are guarding the same person. PG sends Pat Bev to the weak side, but then doubles the post. Kawhi is frozen as the Nuggets get a wide open cut to the hoop. Down one, George falls asleep getting around the simple pin down and Murray casually hits the three. It should be no surprise that the Nuggets love to hit Jokic in the short roll from Murray, yet they decide to rotate from the strong side corner. Kawhi falls asleep for a step and the lead is growing. I'm not sure why Montrez Harrell was even playing at this point since he had been neutralized by Jokic, but here we are. And this time they do rotate properly out of the short roll, but Harrell was late recognizing he needed to contest the wing three and the lead is nine. 
and their last gasp chance to get back in the game ends with a blown layup. They even almost get a big steal at the top of the key, but Murray is able to track it down and give him credit for hitting this tough one, but the Clippers never recover, scoring only two points in seven minutes and losing by 15, which causes Doc to be fired from the Clippers. He quickly headed over to Philadelphia, and that first year, they're the number one seed in the East, playing the fifth seeded Hawks in the second round. Here's the moment. Trey Young gets the flyby and hits the 16 footer to cut the Sixers' lead to two midway through the fourth. Then Herter pulls up over a much shorter Curry for another midi to tie it. They want to go down low in the post, but the only play they really run for him is a pin down for Curry and then turn around to post up instead of some sort of cross screen or even rolling from a ball screen to the post. As a result, Capella can blow this up easily and look where he has to go to get the ball. It's ridiculous they try to run the play again with no time on the shot clock and Harris has to create something on his own and can't hit it. The Trey Young floater killed the Sixers all series long, primarily because Embiid wouldn't step up high enough to contest. And here he goes again on automatic pilot. They continued to leave Curry in for his shooting, but it meant that Herder could feast as the smaller Curry just couldn't do anything more than this to stop him. And then we get to the infamous Simmons post up. He gets a layup, but doesn't shoot it. So the Sixers only come away with one point from the five bowl free throws. With the Hawks left to chase down a loose ball, why is Harris chasing Young out to the half court line? The only way to give them a chance to score is to pull yourself out of position like this and the rest of the defense can't recover. Look at this ridiculous spacing as they don't get Embiid in the block, but hope he can create a good shot with his back to the basket from the elbow. He goes up weak and the end is near, as you have to wonder why Doc's team struggle to get big plays from his stars so consistently. Why do we keep seeing the other team raise their level of concentration so consistently to make the game winning plays? It certainly doesn't help when you see one of the biggest mistakes of the playoffs made here as Thibault tries to contest from behind and nails Herter in the head for three free throws. It wasn't surprising to see Doc call for an ISO out top for Embiid instead of near the basket, and it also wasn't surprising to see him meekly turn it over on a spin move to end the game. And that brings us to the end of the Celtics game, where they force Embiid to switch on to Tatum. And I don't blame him for getting blown by, Tatum can do that to anybody, but look at the body language. The end is near. If Doc can't recognize this is the moment, he will soon, as Harden could shoot the layup, but does generate an open look that Tucker has been hot on, but it's not even close. On the blind pig action, Embiid has no choice but to switch on to Tatum, who's scorching at this point, and check the bench. They literally freak out trying to get someone else to come trap in the corner, but no one budges in that direction as he nails another three. Here's another example of someone on the other team lighting it up on a Doc coach team, as Embiid again can't do anything on this rainbow. The Celtics continued to load up on the Harden and Embiid pick and roll, and the Sixers never came up with anything to combat it. Maxi needs to be cutting baseline here, and this looks so haphazard as they try to run a ball screen right into where Harden is standing. The ball gets deflected, and they get the worst possible outcome you could possibly get short of a pick six turnover. Al Horford manhandled Embiid the entire series, but it was no surprise they just stood around and let Embiid isolate on him from the wing. Nor was it surprising that Horford blocked yet another one of his shots. How about Embiid completely falling asleep on Tatum? I guess he was hoping someone else would run over there to help, but it's now a 15 point lead. We can't see what's going on other than a three on four where Harden just loses the ball and then falls down while throwing it out of bounds here before completely falling apart by not even being in the front court when the ball is thrown to him. In the modern era, we rely so much on three point shooting and it's clear how closely tied the mental aspect is to making shots from outside the arc. Once the Sixers went into flight mode, you could clearly see why they shot three for 21 from behind the arc in the second half. They had no rhythm, no confidence, and Doc had no ability to shake them out of this mindset, which is why there was no comeback. These kind of things happen, I get it, and a lot of responsibility needs to be placed on the players. But when you zoom out far enough, what you see are poorly coached teams who consistently get exposed for not making good decisions nor executing properly on both sides of the ball. And when you add to that the negative body language, overreactions to referees' calls, and problematic communication like telling your guys that the other team wants it more than they do, it's not surprising that we rarely see his stars play well in these situations and carry his team to victory. At some point, you've got to stop pointing your finger at the guys wearing the shorts and realize it's the guy on the bench.